Heavenly Father, indeed, we're so very thankful that you wrap us in your love and you do hold us fast. And Lord, we're so very thankful for your love, thankful for your presence. Thank you for all that you do for us. We just send, pray, Lord, you'll now send your Holy Spirit to be with us. This we ask in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Everything uh, that's been going on this morning has uh, been pointing towards this special time. I want to thank uh, Sherry for her words. Uh, they blend right into what we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, it's, uh, and the song was uh, beautiful. It touched my heart. It was uh, very special. And what was it that uh, Pastor Rojas used to say about uh, how good God was? God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And it's so, it's so right. You know, I have uh, often remember several years ago, I was on top of a house with a roofing crew and uh, putting down a, a new roof. And a fellow walking down the street, and he just hollered up and said, What do y'all know good? Well, Gary Gleason, who I was working with, a uh, member over at the Houston Central Church at the time, he said, life is good and God is good. You know, and he is so right. You know, God is good. And this life that he's given us isn't only good, but it's special. This life that we're living right now is simply a, a preparation for eternity. We aren't made to last forever. Because God wants us to live with him in heaven. One day, you know, my heart's going to stop, and that'll be the end of my earthly body and life. You know, it might happen before the end of Sabbath, in 20 years, or probably somewhere in between. And then again, it might happen before church is over today. We, we just don't know. But when that happens, you know, I'll go into the grave, maybe a, a very short time, maybe 100 years before Jesus returns. We just don't know. We just pray every day that he'll be with us before the end of that day. One thing, though, is for sure. This short time that I spend here on earth is nothing compared to the trillions of years of eternity. This is just a kind of a warm-up act, a dress rehearsal. God wants us to practice here on earth what we'll be doing forever in eternity praising Him, and worshiping Him. You know, we were made by God and for God. That's what makes life special, and the ones that haven't figured that out yet are the ones that, to whom life just sometimes uh, doesn't make sense. But if you think about it, life is just a series of problems. You know, you're either coming out of one now, or you're fixing to get in one, or you're in, in one right now. That's because... God is more interested in your character than your comfort. Yeah, sure, God wants us to be happy, but he's more interested in making your life holy than he is making your life happy. He wants us to grow in character, in Christ-likeness. You know, in all of our lives, we have both good and bad. You know, it doesn't matter how good things are going in your life, there's things that are bad there too. And it doesn't matter how bad things are, there are things that you can always praise God for. We need to stop being you know, self-centered, focusing on our own problems, our issues, our pains, and focus on God and others. You know, we're continually learning during this time on earth. In, in my 80 years here, there's just a few of the things that I've learned, not in any particular order. But one thing is the best classroom in the world is at the feet of an elderly person. When you're in love, it shows. 
that just one person saying to me, you've made my day, makes my day. That having a child fall asleep in your arms is one of the most peaceful feelings in the world, especially if that child is your granddaughter. That when your newborn grandchild holds your finger in her little fist, you're hooked for life. That you should never say no to a gift from a child. Prayer gives power. And that I can always pray for someone when I don't have the physical strength to help them in some other way. Because a day without prayer is a day without power. That no matter how serious your life requires you to be, everybody needs a friend that you can just act goofy with once in a while. That sometimes all a person needs is a hand to hold and a heart to understand. That it's those little daily happenings that make life so spectacular. To ignore the facts doesn't change the facts. That love not time, heals all wounds. That a smile is an inexpensive way to improve your looks. And that everyone deserves to be greeted with a smile. That I wish I could have told my mother, I love you one more time before she passed away. That we should be glad that God doesn't give us everything that we ask for. That everyone live, everybody wants to live on the mountaintop but all the happiness and growth occurs while you're climbing it. The best sermons are lived, not preached. I read one time that God is more interested in what I am than what I do. That's why we're called human beings and not human doings. During happy moments, praise God. Difficult moments, seek God. Quiet moments, worship God. Painful moments, trust God. Every moment, thank God. But you know, sometimes God is a little bit hard to fathom and understand. I'm reminded of a little five year old boy. I think his name was Timmy. And he was eating lunch one day. And he put down his peanut butter and jelly sandwich and he took a big drink of milk. And he asked his mother, he said, uh, Mommy, what does God look like? She said, Well, God is a spirit. And we can't see him in the same way that we see people. And then mom kind of stopped because she wasn't quite sure where to go from there. And Timmy said, well, if we can't see him, how do we know what he's like? Mom said, well, let's suppose you were blind. Would you be able to see daddy? He said, no. He said, well, would you know what daddy's like? He, he thought a minute and said, yes, ma'am. He said, you'd know what daddy is like by the things he says, wouldn't you? He said, yes, ma'am. And you know what God is like, too, by the things that he says in his word. And you'd know that daddy loves you because he'd tell you so and do everything he could for you. That's how we know God loves us, too. He tells us so, and he has given us so much help in this wonderful life. Most of all, he gave us Jesus to take away our sins and to show us what God is really like. And even though... You wouldn't be able to see Daddy if you were blind. You could hear his voice and feel whenever he was near. And in the same way, through Jesus, we can hear God's voice and feel him near too. That's why even though we can't see God, we can be very certain what he's like. So as little Timmy was finishing his sandwich and he stopped again, he, he thought, well, you know, I think I know. You know, we don't see God on the outside. We see God on the inside. You know, and I think Timmy is right. You know, John 4, 24 tells us God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We've all heard that verse many times, but have you ever stopped to think about what it means? Yeah, I think it means that God's not a created physical being like but we are, but we inhabit a fleshly body. Yeah, you know, we're fixed to a specific location, but God is a spirit. He isn't limited to restrictions of this fleshly body. God is all-powerful. He knows everything. He can be everywhere at once. Now, that might create a little, little bit of a problem for us because God is spirit and we're flesh. We have a difficult time reaching out to him. You know, we can't touch him because he's spirit. We can't hear his voice audibly because he's spirit. But let's take our Bibles. Let's look at 1 John 1, 5.
in 1 John 1, 5, God tells of another characteristics of God. John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. You know, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? You know, God is light. You know, we like light. We, we love the sunshine. Scripture draws a contrast between light and darkness, between holiness and evil, between purity and sin. So when Scripture says God is light, it means God is pure and God is holy. Have you ever gone into maybe a, a dimly lit restaurant and had difficult time you know, reading the menu until your eyes adjusted to the darkness? Well, I'm afraid that's exactly what's happened to this world. We've grown accustomed to the darkness. We've grown accustomed to sin and evil. So it's not necessarily good news that God is light because God's light exposes our sin. And we come face to face with the fact that outside of God, we're lost and without hope in this world. That's what makes John 3.16 the most beautiful and best known passage in all the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. Those may be some of the sweetest words that, that we, we could ever hear. To know that God loves us is a very special thing. God's love is special because he loves everybody. You know, regardless of your sex, color of your skin, the language you speak, or, or where you are sociably or, uh, socially or economically. God's love is for all of us, and I think it's important for us to realize it. But this can also create a problem. Whenever we speak of God's love, we tend to let the pendulum swing way far in just one direction. We rightly proclaim that God is love, but we often ignore some of the other characters characteristics of God. Sometimes we tend to give God kind of a, a grandfather image. We turn God into a big grandfather in the sky who loves us so much that he could just never could stand to be separated uh, from us for all eternity. And since God is love, surely he'll just save everybody. Well, when we think about God being love, we tend to forget his other characteristics of righteousness and justice. Because of this, God is compelled to judge us. And without the blood of Jesus to cleanse us, we'll be found guilty and rewarded with eternal death. Love, whether from God or man, must do something because love is an action word. So God, in his love for us, couldn't, couldn't stand idly by while our sins condemned us for all eternity. He had to do something for his, his lost people to show his love. And that's why he sent his son. But, you know, whenever I think about love, a lot of times I'm reminded of a time whenever there was a group of four to eight-year-olds that were asked what, what love means. And so, uh, you know, there's just a few of the answers. They said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore, so grandfather does it for her all the time, even though his hands got arthritis too. That's love. A little four-year-old boy said, when some, someone loves you and they say, they say your name different, you know that your name is safe in their mouth. And a little five-year-old girl said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving clone and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> and, and love when her little boy said, love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. And love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. And love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. Love is when you tell a guy that you like his shirt and he wears it every day. <laughs> This. My mommy loves me more than anybody. You don't see anyone else kissing me to sleep at night. And love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. 
In love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's handsomer than Brad Pitt. But then I know my older sister loves me because she gives me all her old clothes and has to go out and buy new ones. And when you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down, and little stars come out. And you... But the eight-year-old girl said, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People tend to forget. Do you remember how you acted when you first were attracted to the opposite sex? You know, back in the first grade, about 11 or 12 years before I was fortunate enough to meet Diane, there was a pretty little blonde girl that I had a crush on, and I just had to show her. You know, I tried to eat lunch with her. I pushed her high on the swing when we were out in the playground, and I always chased her around when I was playing tag, and I just kind of acted real silly around her. I mean, I think that kind of impressed her. Of course, when I met Diane, I guess I hadn't changed very much. I always wanted to be with her, too. I wrote her poems, sang her songs, and I still kind of acted silly around her. But I don't think she is as impressed as the first grader was. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just feel like we need to, to uh, act out things, don't we? But, you know, I went to college with a, a blind man many years ago. Now, I didn't have any classes with him, but I used to see him in the sub, you know, playing dominoes and talking to some of the other students. And one day he was discussing his lifelong blindness. And he said that he could understand a lot of things, but he couldn't comprehend colors. He said if he hears the color green, he thinks of grass because he can feel grass. And he was told the grass was green. Color, like love, is something that needs to be experienced. You know, how do you describe clouds to someone that's never seen a blue sky? Or how do you describe colors at dusk to someone that's never seen a sunset? For that matter, how do you explain the delicate taste of an exotic food to someone that's never tasted it? You see, there are certain things in life that have to be experienced. That's why God showed us his love to us by sending his only son. God saw the sin that was ruining our lives, and he had to do something about it. And when we experience God's love, we can't stand back either. We must do something about it too. As we look at God's love, there's a, a second thing that we find out. His love isn't something that we can earn. The Bible doesn't say that man so loved God that God was compelled to love him back. No, it says the Bible teaches us that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. You can't earn that kind of love. You can't look nice enough, you can't witness to enough people, and you can't hand out enough literature. You can't give enough tithes or offerings. It's God's free gift to all who will, who will receive it and all who will experience it in their lives. It's important for us to stand back and, and bask in the light of God's love and then allow it to become part of our everyday lives. It's God's gift, God's unspeakable gift to each one of us. You know, there's an old story about a, a man in China that was walking down a, a rain-slicked road. And he lost his footing and fell into a ditch that was filled with mud. And he kept sinking deeper and deeper in the mud. And the more he struggled to get out of the mud, the deeper he sank. And as he was sink, sinking in the mud, Buddha came by. And Buddha looked at him and said, Oh my, what a predicament you're in. Here's a paper that has ten ways to get out of ditches. Well, the man started reading the ten ways, and he tried them all. But he, he kept getting deeper and deeper, the more that he tried. Then Confucius came along, and he looked at him and said, Oh, you're in a terrible condition. I have good news for you. You take five steps towards me, I'll take five steps toward you, and then we'll walk out of the ditch together. Well, the guy couldn't make those five steps. He kept getting deeper and deeper. Well, then Jesus came by. Jesus looked at him, took off his crown and his royal robes, got down in the ditch with him, and pushed him until his feet were on solid ground again. You know, just like the old song says, from sinking sand he lifted me, with tender hands he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh, praise his name, he lifted me. Amen. You know, it's said that uh, Leonardo da Vinci was a vegetarian, and he's a great lover of animals. 
More than once, whenever he saw a cage of birds in the market to be sold for food, he bought the entire lot just, just to set them free. Well, let's look at that same story with different characters. We see Jesus walking through the corridors of eternity. He comes across Satan with a, a cage full of human beings. What are you going to do with those people? Jesus asked Satan. Well, I'm eventually going to kill them. I'm going to entice them to sin, and they'll sin more and more without even realizing that the wages of sin is death. So they'll just die in their sins. When Jesus said, well, I want to buy them. I'll give you all the gold in the world and the cattle on a thousand hills. Satan says, no, that's not enough. You'll never pay the price that I want. Jesus said, well, then how much do you want? He said, I want your blood. I want your life. I want it all. So, so Jesus went to the cross, and he died so that he could open Satan's door and set us free. He freed us from Satan's sinful hold on us so that when we see him coming in the clouds of glory, we can fly like those released birds to live with him forever. That's how great God's love is for you and for me. You've heard about it. You know all the facts. But you haven't experienced but if you haven't experienced his love firsthand, he invites you to open your heart and open your life to Jesus. God's invitation is extended to all of us in love because God is love. That's right. Our dear and loving Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for your love. We know, Lord, that you've done everything that you can to help us to be able to live with you in eternity. And we know it's, it's our place now to turn our hearts and our love to you. We just ask, Lord, that you'll help us to do that. Help us to be able to have the strength. This we ask in Jesus' dear and loving name. Amen.